Welcome to my CCNA Security Chapter 4 Lecture Review. Chapter 4 is about implementing firewall technologies. We're going to talk about ACLs. We're going to talk about the different types of firewall technologies. We're going to segment that into zone-based policies. And that'll be it for this chapter. So jumping right in, an ACL is an access control list and typically is made up of access control entities, sometimes called an ACE. So what we're looking at is this section is helping us to understand the syntax and how to configure an ACL, both for IPv4 and IPv6. And we're in the middle, talk about how we can mitigate common attacks using ACLs. So how do we configure a standard and extended ACL? Here we're talking about specifically IPv4. So it's about placement of the ACL and we have to be able to define certain things first. A very common placement for our ACL actually is When we're talking about the extended ACLs, because the extended ACLs can be um, filter both source and destination addresses, we actually want to place the extended ACL as close to the source as possible. So if we're talking about being able to deny FTP traffic, we may want to apply the ACL as it enters R3 if this is our source. If we're talking about a standard ACL, we want to place it close to the destination. So the first thing is, what denotes standard versus extended a ACLs? First of all, ranges. 1 through 99 is a standard ACL. 100 through 199 is an extended ACL. And again, the extended ACL can filter off of source and destination. where the standard one we filter off of source only. So here is the basic syntax. Access list provided a number, an action, and then if we're talking standard, source address, and wildcard mask. If we're dealing with a extended ACL, very similar, except you'll notice here we actually have let me get my pin. Protocol. Then source, wildcard. Destination, and wildcard. And if we have an operator's port. Like we could say protocol TCP, and the operator port could be blocking or permitting a specific TCP port. We also have the ability to do named ACLs. And that's going to be an IP access list. Whether you define it as a standard or extended, then you do a named ACL. The sub interface will actually become a NACL. Oh, I can't do my hash, my pound. So you'll actually see the NACL pound sign so that you can configure that named ACL. And again, we have the standard access control entities, or entries, when necessary. The standard and extended are the common ones, and you're seeing more named ACLs, especially as we implement more IPv6 material. So next is, how do we apply it? So what we have to do is, we actually have to navigate to the interface that we want to apply it. IP access group or access class, uh, depending on if it's a line or an interface. Access class is a line. IP access group is a interface. You provide the number and or name, and then you provide it if you want to filter it as it goes into that interface, or if you want to do it as it exits that interface. 
An example would be, here we have a uh, name standard ACL called no access. Notice that it went from standard no access, STD hyphen in ACL, named ACL. You put in your appropriate commands, deny host, permit any, exit out of the standard name ACL, and you applied this as an IP access group, the name, and then you're going to apply this as it leaves that interface, gig 0 slash 0, as it is denoted that line right there. If you're an example of a named extended ACL, IP access list extended the appropriate name, notice it actually now is an extended or EXT in ACL. Put in the appropriate commands there and there and then apply it to the interface. Again you can actually do in or out. Normally they don't want you to do multiple ACLs as you leave a single interface, but you can actually do one filter coming in and one filter going out. How do we do that with a, a line interface? Same thing. Access class, the appropriate ACL and or name, and you want to filter it as it comes in or goes out. Here's an example of a named ACL for a VTY with logging. IP access list, set up the items, the permits, then you apply it to the interface. Line, that's where we're going. Access class, and we're going to filter it as it comes in. Notice access class, not access group. Basically, you create an ACL globally, and then you apply it. You make sure that the last statement is an implicit deny, because even if you don't, there's already one there. Remember the statement, order is important. It will actually process top-down, and once it matches a object, uh, the list is no longer processed. So ensure the most specific statements are on the top of the list. Remember that only one ACL is allowed per interface. And new statements for existing ACLs are added at the bottom of the list. Router generated packets are not filtered by outbound ACLs. And this is the last, like, the really important one. Standard ACLs as close to the destination as possible. Extended ACLs as close to the source as possible. Those are really important to remember. An important part is how do we verify? We can do show access lists or well, show access list is the big one. Remember if you do any editing they occur at the bottom. We also have this called sequence numbering. You can actually, when you do an ACL, you can add sequences, uh, sequence numberings. That way, they'll actually go in order of the sequence number. All right. So let's look at how an ACL will mitigate an attack. We can actually configure ACLs to deny certain IP addresses and to allow only the ones that we want. Assuming we actually place them on the interface, we can make sure that it will do what we need it to do. Permitting the uh, only necessary traffic through the firewall. Basically, we'll block everything and only allow what we need. Why allow POP3 or IMAP if we don't use it? We can also mitigate things like ICMP, uh, ICMP abuse. We can make sure to allow 
certain types of ICMP packets like echo reply, source qu uh, quenching, unreachable, but we could block everything else. So again, we have some control with what we can do. If we're looking at mitigating SNMP exploits, we can actually deny SMP requests from a WAN interface. Moving on, let's talk about IPv6 ACLs. So IPv4 firewalls sees and allows IPv4 UDP traffic. Well, an attacker may gain access via a foothold via IPv4 and then they could start sending rogue IPv6 router advertisements so that we could pivot from our hosts. So you can actually set up the appropriate ACLs for both IPv4 and IPv6 for better protection. IPv6 does use named ACLs, so it would be IPv6, access list, and then the access list name. After that, permit deny, very similar to an extended ACL, protocol type, source, destination, operator if necessary. Here's an example, IPv6 access list, we're calling it LAN only. We list our permits, we do our deny, we apply it to an interface, And it works. Section 4.2 is about firewall technologies. Goal of this is to be able to explain how firewalls are used to help secure the network, talk about the different types of firewalls, and configure a basic firewall. Lastly, explain design considerations for implementing different firewall technologies. All right, so 421, securing the network for the firewall. All firewalls, they help resist to attack. They are only transit points between networks similar to a router, and they enforce access control policies, or ACPs. Notice a router and a firewall generate a firewall. So a router, while it may be similar to a firewall, doesn't mean that the firewall still does routing capability. Here we're running iOS firewalls. Those are software-based firewall. Limitation of the firewalls, typically they allow certain types of traffic but you actually have to configure them with permit or deny lines. Different types of firewalls do exist. Packet filtering deal with layer 3 and 4. Stateful is layers 5, 4, and 3. A NAT deals with 3 and 4, similar to packet filtering. An application deals with 7, 5, 4, and 3. So different types of firewalls for different types of ports. Well, different types of firewalls monitor different types of ports. For example, packet filtering benefits, they uh, filter based off of source uh, IP protocols, uh, sequence uh, start packets, Things of that nature. Stateful firewalls operate layers 5, 4, and 3, and so they'll get a state table and they build for stateful inspections. Stateful firewall operations, again, they go off of port numbers more specifically. Benefits, um, Means of a defense, stronger packet filtering, 
uh, richer data logs. They don't look at application layers. They don't filter stateless protocols. No authentication and difficult to defend against dynamic port negotiations because they're basing uh, that off of stateful protocols. We have what's called a next generation firewall or NF, sorry, an NGF and that helps things like use an IPS have more granular identification visibility and better behaviors within applications. Web interface, that's, you also have a ability to restrict web and web applications based off reputation. They are more proactive for protection against internet threats. They are the new version of the firewall. Next generation firewall, NGF. We have a traditional or classic firewall and we have inbound or outbound filtering based off of deny and permit statements. It, it will examine a packet as it comes in. It will verify if it's allowed. If allowed, it goes out. Because this is coming from the inside out, it's stateful. Or sorry, this is established, not stateful. It's established because it's starting, it's establishing from inside out. That way when the quest comes back in, it will be allowed. What we have to do is we have to realize we have the appropriate inspection sessions. And we choose the internal and external interfaces when we're dealing with a firewall. We configure the appropriate ACLs for both. We define the appropriate inspection rules. And then we apply those inspection rules per interface. Whether it be an inside or outside zone. So how do we look at firewalls in the overall network design? Normally firewalls are out facing. You don't put one in the network per se. You put it on the outside leg going to the ISP or going to an IS some type of internet connection. You could also do firewalls uh, in between key segments of networks, like a demilitarized zone. That way you can have key servers direct access to the internet, yet the internal doesn't have direct access directly from the DMZ to them. Everything will flow through this device. So, even if the MZ traffic wanted to access the network, it wouldn't be allowed to. Where the private network could request and establish a connection, and then it would be allowed back in. But only if the private is initiating it. The important uh, part we're going to start discussing is what's called zone-based policies or ZPF and that is where you actually have multiple zones instead of just large clumps of networks. The core thing for understanding is layered defense. We look at things like network core security, perimeter, endpoint, and communication. It's not just about a single layer anymore. It's about multi-layer protection. One of the last major sections deals with this ZPF, or Zone-Based Policy Firewalls. We're going to look at how the policies are used to help secure the network, explain the operations, and how to configure them. Zone-based 
policies. They are not dependent on ACLs. The router security posture is to block unless explicitly allowed, so a little bit better protection. Policies are easy to read and troubleshoot. One policy may affect any given amount of traffic instead of needing multiple ACLs and in the inspection action. So the ZPF design are th common ones are like land to internet. Firewall rules between private and public servers may be redundant uh, connections. So design steps would be determine the appropriate zones, determine the determine and establish the appropriate zones, design the physical infrastructure, and then identify subsets within the zones and merge traffic requirements. ZPF uh, operations. We have three main actions. Inspect, drop, or pass. Inspect will configure for stateful inspection. Drop will basically deny. Pass will be more like permit. We have the ability to do source or destination interfaces or pairing. So how do we configure a ZPF? First we create the zone. We identify traffic with a class map. We define action with a policy map. We identify zone pairs and match it to a policy map. We assign the zones to the appropriate interfaces. And those are the five steps in a nutshell. Step one, create both an internal and external zone. Internal, here we're calling uh, private. External, we're calling public. Next, we identify the traffic with a class map. And uh, the big ones are, like if we're doing class map, we do a type inspection. If we're matching any or matching all, and we give it a name, we will match it based off of an ACL. So match access group, ACL, match protocol if necessary, or match class map, again, if necessary. You guys can read the parameters and the description about that. Big part here is we're creating an ACL and then we're matching to that ACL. We can match protocols also. Define the action. So we would do a policy map, type inspection, or inspect, policy map. You can also do a class type inspect and map that to a class map. And that will actually be a class map will be a P map C. And that's where you can actually do the inspect, drop, or pass. Here we have an example of a policy map that will inspect. We're calling that private to public policy. And we're defining the class type to inspect as HTTP traffic. And what we're trying to do is inspect the traffic. Identify zone pairs and match to a policy. Zone pair security. Name it. Source. Destination. And then we'll set up a service policy. And we can do that so that we can tie it back to a policy map. Here we have a zone pair example. Zone pair security. We name it private to public source the private destination to public that will give us the ability to then call service policy we're going to inspect it and which policy map do we want here we're calling the private public policy 
Lastly, we apply it to an interface. We do that through navigating to the appropriate interface and then we'll zone member that and we'll actually member it to the named zones. Zone member, security, and then what zone name they're in. For verification, we have the appropriate show commands, show run, class map, show policy map, class map, zone security. Again, ZPF, no filtering is applied for intra-zone traffics, trafficking. Only one zone is allowed per interface. No classic firewall and ZPF configuration on the same interface. Traffic to self zones are not filtered. And that is the end of this chapter. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you. You have a great day.